I think one of the things that's happened to music as, as, as time has gone on and as we've gotten, you know, headed towards the end of the 20th century and coming into the 21st, one of the things that's happened is, um, you know, that, that the musical side of things became a somewhat diluted, and I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I don't want to, I can't blame any one thing, but MTV didn't help that much because it put more of an emphasis on how somebody looks or what's the video like and how's, how's it presented and how's it, how does it look? How does that music look? <laughs> and that, that started a trend where, you know, that people, um, people are looking for something in music that isn't musical and music used to be playing notes and compositionally was one thing but there were there was a message along with it a lot of the time for most of the time there was some something that was compelling people to do this to make music so they had something to say whether it was about love an actual in an actual heartfelt way rather than a just I'm going to have a commercial hit, um, motivated way. Uh, it's it's just, it, the trend has seemed to me to shift away from really having a real message and and uh, to to more like I want to become popular for being popular <laughs> type type attitude. And is there anything you think that like my generation can do to change that? Like, or is it inevitably going in that direction? As, as far as the, the, the aspects of, of music where I, I, what I would consider to be a negative trend of like losing focus on musicianship, losing focus on genuine lyrical content with a message or something worth saying, um, those negative trends, you know, are, you know, maybe it's inevitable, but also change is inevitable. And at some point, I'm hoping it will shift to where people will go, you know, this, this empty stuff is not very fulfilling and I want to hear something real. And, and I'm hoping, but, but who knows? I, 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 I don't know how to predict the future, but there's certainly every possibility that if, if younger people uh, began to care and go, you know what would be really cool instead of playing video games all day, I'm going to learn how to play guitar or, or violin or some instrument and, and and, and express myself and it could happen but it's up to the people it's it's you know uh, it's only going to happen if people you know take take the challenge or uh, with for themselves and, and and do something about it when you look at the music industry and the way it's evolved or devolved depending on how you <laughs> look at it um, you know the way that the the old model of uh, the, the big record company and, and all that that, that's so drastically changed, and certainly the internet has played a part in that. But let's be honest about it and fair about it. The way that the record companies handled the evolving technology has a lot to do with it, too. They were not very smart about it. They didn't um, take advantage of the ways to make it better for everybody, where they could, they could have made more money and people could have bought music for less and everything else and it had it be a lot more friendly. But it became, you know, with downloading and, and, you know, outright piracy of music, which I don't approve of, but the way that the music industry uh, handled it, uh, just it turned it into a completely adversarial um, stance from the start. And, and that, that, I don't think that was very intelligent. <laughs> so not very surprising then that the record companies have ended up suffering because, as a result. But there's, not, there's no, not one, it's, it's not so simple as to say there's one single factor there. It's not just because people download and it's, uh, you know, so, some people buy stuff too. And, and it's, it's just the way, un the unfortunate way that, 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 uh, that the business was dealt with in terms of the end consumer, the people, the real people out there that want to hear music. And so now it's like, it's just kind of a big mess now. I don't know if it'll ever get fixed, quite honestly. The, the, the biggest problem to me is that now if I, if I were a young kid and I'm writing a song, you know, and then 
if everybody, there's a certain attitude that, that I think is unfortunate that there are people that think that music really should just be free somehow, but they don't expect the plumber to come in and fix their plumbing for free or to, you know, somebody to, to I don't know, get, provide anything that they consider real world for free. But it's a real world. To, it's hard work to make music. It's hard work to come up with a good song. And so I look at, if I were a young songwriter, I'm going, wow, I might never, never see, I might never get any royalties at all as a songwriter. No publishing money, no nothing. Because um, people think it should be free. And really, you know, the, the royalty rates for songwriters, it's not like if, if somebody buys a song that the, the songwriter gets, you know, $45 or something, you get like pennies. You know, it doesn't cost the consumer a lot of money to actually pass along. Hey, thanks for, thank you, John Lennon. <laughs> um, you know, it's, 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 you only make a lot of money if a whole lot of people really like your music. And, but to take it away, the, the possibility for a young person to actually make a decent living being creative at music, that's the, that's the saddest tragedy of, of all about what's happened with uh, the music industry. I don't feel sad so much for the big record companies <laughs> and stuff. I, but I feel sorry for where, where it's left. What's a musician supposed to do now? So what is yeah. the creative process like, you know, working with, uh, when it comes to like, like great musicians like yourself and all these artists that you work with, what's the creative process like in a band or with other artists? The creative process is, it's different every time you embark, you know, on, on writing a song or coming up with an arrangement. That's what's cool about music. You never know what to expect, and um, well, that's one of the things that's cool about it. But to me, anyway, and are we losing that when it comes to technology-based music? I think certainly, you know, uh, there are times when the, the true creativity is hampered by technology. <laughs> when it's, especially if people, if when they start relying on building. Uh, you know, a recording in a very artificial way. And what I like is about some of the old days is when it's of, of, of like real people sitting together, write, writing a song, trading ideas lyrically, musically, really playing instruments, and then recording it with real instruments. And, you know, and, you know, that's where the technology can get in the way sometimes. You can get hung up. Making things too perfect, maybe. Are there a lot of ways? There are a lot of pitfalls to the technology, but I'm. I. I it's not the technology's fault. It's. It's our fault if we let ourselves get hung up in it. Yeah. You know, the technology is cool. Believe me, I don't mind. I. You know, I've had my own studio since I could afford to have one, and that's. So I've. I've got my old 24-track tape machine is still sitting out there. I, I do not miss calibrating that machine every day, you know, and, and handling those giant, you know, really heavy tape reels and degaussing and, and, and I, I've got, I get weeks every year back by not having to rewind a tape every time you do a take on a yeah. recording. So I, the technology, a lot of it is great. I mean, the technology, it's not the technology's fault if the technology is abused, it's the abuser's fault. In any era of music, you know, there, everybody wants people to like their music, but for the musician, I think, I, I know I can speak for myself, my goal has always been to just do something that I think is good music. And that, if that's the motivation, the music is probably going to be better. <laughs> and that might be one of the reasons why classic rock has become such a popular genre and, and is enduring the way it is. That's this. That's this guitar. And I couldn't care less about my covers. I want to own all of you. But you can tell them other guys that they ain't getting up. And that's my old Fender Steel out there, made in like 1957 or 8. Totally direct. No, no, I put a little bit of delay on it, but it's that's the wow. way that is. 
That's the squire. That's just. And so you don't have to put any like odds or anything like that. This is just the sound of the talk. So how do you feel then? Uh, just I guess impromptu question I want to ask you. You know, a lot of these musicians out there nowadays, they feel like they have to overdub and layer and auto tune and add all these different effects to their guitars. You just proved you can. You know, if you had the talent, you could just pull it off direct. Well. You know, I mean, I, I use effects, I use plugins and things, and but to me, you know, it, it's all about what what can you actually do, what can you deliver, and you know, that's to, that's what's real to me, you know, and that's I, I'm not hearing a lot of that. <laughs> I'm not hearing a lot of that attitude in in people's work ethic anyway of, of music that I hear coming. As far as the whole punk movement and uh, my take on it and what I saw and you know where I was coming from with it uh, I had in what was it 1975 I think it was moved with my I was in a group called Clover and we moved to Great Britain we moved to England and we moved over there and we recorded a couple of our albums uh, for Phonogram UK and we lived over there for a few years but we were the band on Elvis Costello's My Aim Is True album his debut album and so I played all the lead guitar and pedal steel and everything on Elvis's first album. <laughs> so, and which is, some people consider that to be a punk record or certainly a new wave. And so here is this California, you know, hippie band, <laughs> a hillbilly hippie band. We were the band on his debut album. And, um, yeah, which was like, like a Rolling Stone magazine album of the year and stuff like that. And, you know, it's gone gold and platinum all over the world. So, you know, I was part of something that is actually considered to be iconic in that realm. But here we were, we had moved to Britain and right when the punk thing, really wrong timing for us because we were a lot more like, you know, I don't know, maybe like the Eagles or something than, than the Sex Pistols. <laughs> so... It, all of a sudden, we were like totally in the wrong place at the wrong time. But we ended up being part, being part of the scene anyway, uh, musically speaking. But it was, you know, um, you're right. You're, you know, one thing that was lacking maybe in some of the all the energy, which was cool, and the attitude of some of the new wave stuff and the punk, if you want to call it that. We're looking at labels again, but was. There's missing, for the most part, some musicianship, you know, and that's what I think, you know, us older folks, <laughs> that was more important to us, maybe. I don't know. I don't know exactly why, but, uh, but, you know, that's, I, I don't mean to be critical of a, a genre or you know, any particular artists or anything, but just as an observation, I think for me, there was a little bit lacking in terms of musicianship, but, you know, every, it's, it's, it's kind of cool when music gets pulled one way or another, you know, at, at least it was music. <laughs> at least it was guy, pe really, really real people playing instruments. And that's one of the things that I have a, a real uh, an issue with. I don't like records where there's nobody that can actually sing on the record, nobody that can actually play. There's nothing real about it. And that, well, a lot of people are having hits with that, you know. That's crazy. Well, classic rock, I mean, any label for any style of music, whether it's classic rock or country or this, you, know, you could play 10 different country artists and they don't sound the same. Or, you know, or, or in classic rock, you know, it, labels with music are, you know, it's, it's, if, you could, if you could tell what it was by a label, then you wouldn't even have to listen to it, right? So uh, classic rock, but it, but yeah, and yet at the same time, it, it, it takes on its meaning and with, with how people use it and how they look at it. And classic rock has become, I reckon, that um, maybe a lot of it has to do with the era that the music came from. You know, a, a lot of it does have to do with that. But I don't know if, if it's really a style. If there could be, there be a new group that you would call a classic rock group. So in, in a way, it's a different type of terminology than a lot of the other ones, like country or something, is that country is more timeless. Classic rock seems to be tied to a certain era. Well, when it comes to music, you know, that, and, and when people talk about classic rock, it's, I, it's, it's interesting because 
it's it's certainly not one style. I mean, Leonard Skinner doesn't sound anything like Yes or Queen or, you know, but that's, nowadays, that's all classic rock and the Doobie Brothers are and you name it. And um, there's so many different stylistic approaches within what's called classic rock. So to, I suppose that it has to do to a large degree with the era of the music itself. And, but maybe because of that, it has to do with a mindset because there was a more of a mindset of that era of, of, of experimentation and of really trying on your instruments and trying to come up with something different than the other guy. And uh, it was a real creative period, I think, musically, uh, where all kinds of different things were being experimented with. When you go back and look at the, the, the early roots or the early recordings that became known as rock and roll and classified as rock and roll, and you look at like the Burnett brothers and, and, uh, and Carl Perkins and these people, they were basically country musicians. Uh, they were coming from a very country music uh, you know, background and perspective and you know, they, but they were influenced by you know, the blues music that they were hearing in their whatever region you know, they were coming from and all of a sudden there's this new thing. And you know, if you go back even further, you look at bluegrass, a lot of people don't realize bluegrass is essentially like Celtic music with blues notes in it. You know, that's what makes it bluegrass, really. That's, you know, and so the, the blues and country have always had this kind of like uh, little, little dance going on of like influencing each other. And certainly with rock and roll, I think, you know, you look at the, the, some of the early big hits of rock and roll and they were um, very country influenced. A lot of Elvis's records. You know, uh, in particular Elvis Presley, that is. Um, not the other Elvis. Um, <laughs> Elvis the first. But, that, you know, the, but country music has had a huge influence on it. And, like, look at the Everly Brothers. And their, their father was, he played guitar. He was a, a, a pal of, like, Chet Atkins, and they, well, who produced the Everly Brothers. Chet Atkins produced those records, you know. And, uh, and those guys, you know, the Everlys were like one of the biggest, what was considered rock or rock and roll acts of their time and great music, uh, but very, very country influenced. And that influenced the Beatles. If you look, listen to a song like Please Please Me, those harmonies are completely, very clearly where, you know, the one note is held by, you know, one of the singers and while the other one moves around it, that's very Everly Brothers. That, they were copying Kathy's Clown, as a matter of fact, particularly on Please Please, in my opinion. But, uh, but doing a great job. I mean, they, they made it their own. But they were very heavily influenced. They've admitted it, you know, by the Everlys, by a lot of different people, too. I mean, the Beatles were the masters of taking uh, cool stuff and maybe making it even cooler, you know, <laughs> but certainly making it their own. But you know, it was a big influence, you know, country music. And, and you listen to the guitar solo on, uh, on uh, All My Lovin' by the Beatles. It's completely Chet Atkins. <laughs> and then the Beatles covered Buck Owens songs, you know. Uh, so clearly country had a, a, a big influence on the evolution of rock and roll. In this day and age of the internet, where everyone's attention is so quickly all over the place, do you think it's possible for one band to ever have the attention of the world again? Well, but looking back on, on a group like the Beatles, you know, it's, it's like that, that is, uh, you know, by all, any, anybody's account, I mean, you have, we have to admit, that is a phenomenal occurrence. Like, they were just so great. I mean, so how often does something like that happen? It's hard to say, and I, I don't pretend to be wise enough to have a real good answer for that. But it's certainly possible that something that great will happen again, and, and maybe even inevitable. But, uh, but wow, you know, I don't think it happens that often. Obviously it doesn't, because it, you know, <laughs> it just, it's, um, it's, it's just difficult in this world for all, for so many things to just come together in this magical way. But, you know, 
I, I, I still have hope, you know, I think, I think I wouldn't give up on it, I, you know, but there again, it's just, it's going to take people, you know, it's going to take individuals having whatever it takes, the inspiration, the motivation to, to pursue uh, a, a certain type of, of, of excellence and, 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 you know, goals with music. An interesting question to me has always been where, where do you draw the line between hard rock and heavy metal? And I've, I've, some people categorize certain music in a, as, as one or the other. That I don't always agree with it. It's like, well, that's heavier than that, and you're calling this, that, you're calling that heavy, heavy metal, and that hard rock, but that's this hard rock song to me sounds heavier than, and it's like, well, and there again, that's, that's the musical terminology. Maybe we all interpret it a little differently too. That's particularly, that's one that's always puzzled me. Because like you say, to me, heavy, ACDC is heavier than anybody. I mean, they're as heavy as anybody. And if that's just hard rock though, well, okay, I get it, whatever. But then people consider like Led Zeppelin heavy metal and a lot of their stuff is acoustic. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, some people consider it heavy metal. They were originally called heavy metal. I don't just, I don't totally disagree, but I, it's kind of interesting to me because if you really listen to their catalog, there's a lot of their stuff that's a lot more acoustic. It's not metal. And, and Moby, Moby Grape is a group that, that Led Zeppelin has cited as one of the biggest influences on them. And they were not metal at all. I mean, they were one of my favorite groups ever. They were great. They're incredible. But I, I never got that. I never saw the connection. But in, in the guys in Zeppelin's mind, Moby Grape, they were, thought they were doing music that, they obviously thought that they were doing something like Moby Grape because they cite them as a huge influence. So, I don't know, I guess it becomes very subjective. So how do you feel about radio stations playing grunge bands and alternative rock bands within classic rock nowadays? That's interesting because, you know, <laughs> for a person of, of my vintage, my particular age, you know, grunge was like new stuff at one point, and uh, for it to be, you know, kind of lumped in with classic rock. But you know, that's the telescopic aspect of looking at uh, not just music, but anything. And you know, historically, that we it's kind of like it's you know, the, the farther away from thing, events they get, and the more that the more distant ones they look a lot closer together than they once might have seemed. Hey, thanks for watching. My name is Daniel Sarkissian. I'm an independent filmmaker from Toronto. I hate that guitar, but I yeah, I can play that in one scale. <laughs> don't don't like, you dare laugh. You know, I try to embrace the rock and roll spirit in the sense of I do everything self-funded and independently made with no oversight. As such, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for watching.